Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Paul Lutheran Church on this, the sixth Wednesday in the season of Lent. Uh, for those of you in person, we have two candles left on our cross, uh, reflecting that five weeks of the season of Lent have passed. Um, next week, we'll be down to one candle on Monday, Thursday, and then it will be dark on Good Friday, Holy Friday. I would like to welcome those that are joining us via our YouTube channel. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Reverend Lewis Bolt. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Hammond, Louisiana. We're glad you found our channel, and we're glad you're able to participate with us this day. If you haven't already done so, please click the link in the description of the video. It will take you to a PDF of the service so that you can follow along and participate wherever you happen to be. Uh, there will be times when I invite the congregation to stand, and that's as you are able. If you're not able to stand, you can remain seated. And we'll have organ accompaniment uh, this day. Uh, the first hymn and the last hymn will have a brief introduction, and then we'll begin singing. The hymn of the day will have a full introduction, because it's a new hymn. It's not famous last words of the pastor. It's not complicated. But uh, so uh, that we'll have a, a full introduction to that, just so you can hear the full melody. Um, I don't think there are any other surprises in store for us. Not that I fixed the hymn board, that is. And uh, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have called us to this place where your glory dwells, where your light shines forth through your word. May that word that is read and proclaimed in this place lead us to repentance, that we may be turned around and brought back to you to receive the forgiveness that Jesus has won for us and freely pours out upon us. Bless this time that we have together as we give you thanks and praise for everything that you continue to do for us through your beloved Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn uh, 609. And I'm on the wrong page, so I'm handling the wrong way. Uh, so, Jesus sinners doth receive with a brief introduction. <laughs> Thank you. 
opening versicles found on page 260 in your hymnal. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and repents of evil. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Please be seated as our service will continue as we speak the words of the Old Testament canticle beginning on page 261 in your hymnal. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known and all be heard. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Our service will continue with the first reading, which is from the book of Jonah, chapters 3 and 4, uh, for this, the sixth Wednesday in the season. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it in the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our source continues with part five of the Passion Count. It starts on the insert, and it's, it's an extended reading, so it goes on the back of the insert, then back to the bulletin. The soldiers now had charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the city to a place called Skull Hill, in Hebrew, Golgotha. As they led him away, 
they laid hold of Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was coming in from the country. On him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Following him was a great company of people and of women who bewailed and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never gave suck. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things with a green tree, what will happen with a dry one? There will also two others, criminals, whom they led along to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called Golgotha, they gave him wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. It was the third hour, and there they crucified him. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The two criminals, they also crucified with him, one on his right, the other on his left, with Jesus in the middle. The scripture was then fulfilled, which said, and he was numbered with the transgressors. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they cast lots to divide his clothes and decide what each should take. They made four parts, one for each soldier. There remained his tunic, which was without seam, woven in one piece from the top to the bottom. They said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide who shall have it. The scripture was thus fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. These things the soldiers did, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Over his head was put the charge against him. Pilate wrote the notice to be put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title was read by many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, You should not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. People stood by watching. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross that we may see and believe. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him wine and saying, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. The thieves were crucified with him, also reviled him. And one of the criminals who hung there with him railed at him. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Near to the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clovis, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Ali, Ali, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of them that were standing up there heard it, they said, He's calling for Elijah. After this, Jesus knew that all things were accomplished. Fulfilling the scripture, he said, I thirst. There was a jar of wine standing there. One of them ran immediately to get a sponge. He filled it with wine, put it on a reed, and held it up to his mouth, and gave it to him to drink. Others said, 
Wait and see if Elijah will come and save him. When Jesus had received the wine, he cried out with a loud voice, It is finished. Then he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion who stood there facing him saw how he died, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. All the people who had gathered to see the sights, when they saw what had happened, turned away, beating their breasts. Those who had known him stood at a distance, as also the women who had followed him from Galilee. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. It was the day of preparation before the Sabbath, and this was, was Passover Sabbath. Therefore, so that the bodies should not remain on the crosses during the Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies removed. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. One who saw it is our witness. And his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth that you also may believe. These things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. By this time evening had come. A respected member of the council, Joseph of Arimathea, was one who was looking for the kingdom of God a good and righteous man who had not consented to their purpose and deed. He was a disciple of Jesus secretly, for he feared the Jews. Now he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was astonished that he could be dead already. He called for the centurion and asked him whether Jesus was already dead. When he was assured by the centurion that it was so, Pilate granted Joseph the corpse and commanded him to give it over to him. Joseph brought, bought fine linen and came and took the body of Jesus. Nicodemus came also, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. It was he who had first come to Jesus by night. They then took the body of Jesus and wrapped it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb, where no one had ever been buried. Joseph laid the body in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and departed. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were sitting there opposite the sepulcher and saw where he was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandments. On the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees went together to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command that the sepulcher be made secure until the third day to stop his disciples from coming and stealing him and saying to the people, He has risen from the dead, making the final deception worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go and make it secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our service continues with the responsory for the season of Lent on page 263. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered from the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered from the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. 
He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Our service will continue as we review three of the six chief parts of the faith, beginning with the Ten Commandments, that we will recite together. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I invite you to stand as you are able as we confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of Jesus, whose broad love extends to every single person. Amen. Please be seated for the sermon. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Just how big is the love of God in Christ Jesus? This is the theme that we've been exploring throughout these midweek services during this Lenten season. And this week, we will consider the dimensions of God's love in its breadth and its width. You and I, we have a tendency to draw a circle around people who we think are the right kind of people. Our kind of people. Uh, People who are worth caring about. People who are worth worrying about. People who are worth speaking well about. People who are worth treating with dignity and value. And perhaps for you, that's a very, very big circle. Maybe there aren't too many people outside of your circle. And yet, for each one of us, there is a temptation at some point to draw that line whether we realize it or not, and to regard those who are on the other side of our line as bad, offensive, despicable, evil, nasty, unworthy of our love, not to mention our pity and our care. There was a great prophet of the Old Testament who acted this way famously. Uh, In the book of Jonah, Uh, from our reading that we heard earlier, part of the book of Jonah, we read about God's call. We read about God's call to the prophet to go and preach repentance to the ultimate enemy of God's people, to the ruthless Assyrians and their ruthless king right in their capital city of Nineveh. You probably know the story. Instead of obeying, listening and obeying God and going to Nineveh, Jonah headed off in the exact opposite direction. He hitched a ride on a ship sailing west. God sends a storm on the sea. Jonah gets tossed into the sea and God rescues Jonah in the belly of a great fish so that he would not drown and to preserve him. Jonah prays to God. And the fish vomits Jonah up on dry ground. And that's where our sermon text picks up. 
here in Jonah chapter 3. Here in this chapter, God commands Jonah a second time to go to Nineveh and to call the Assyrians to repentance. And I would like you to take note as I read the text once more, the stark contrast, the stark contrast between how wide God's mercy is and how not so wide Jonah's mercy is. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his false, his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was still yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? This is our text. You may not know this, but the Assyrians, the Assyrians were the scourge of the world in Jonah's day. They were known for brutally subjugating different people groups and torturing anybody who dared oppose them. There is an ancient artwork that's been uh, uncovered by archaeologists that, that depicts the Assyrians. It's a little graphic for an early Wednesday morning, but it depicts, it depicts the Assyrian troops skinning people alive and impaling people alive on sharp poles. This is who the Assyrians were. Some years after Jonah, it would be the Assyrians who would annihilate the northern kingdom of Israel, 10 of the 12 tribes of God's people, and erase them from history. About the same time, the Assyrians would invade the southern kingdom of Judah. And while God would rescue Jerusalem at that time, historians estimate that as much as 50% of the population of Judah was either killed or carried off, forced march to a life of slavery in various parts of the Assyrian Empire. If, if Jonah were going to draw a circle with certain people outside of the circle who did not deserve love or mercy, it makes sense that he would have the Assyrians outside his line. But God did not. The, the pity of God, the mercy of God, the love of God drew no lines. 
It extended all the way to their capital city, all the way to the king on his throne. Because of their great sin, God declared that his judgment was at hand and that Nineveh would be overthrown. But because of God's great mercy, he sent them a prophet, a man to speak his word and to lead them to repentance. He took pity on them, and God spared them. And that made Jonah very mad. Now, this is very, very different from a pastor uh, no relation to the people in the, sitting in the pew this morning. Different spelling, but Pastor Henry Gerke. Okay, different, different family unit. Pastor Gerke was a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor from St. Louis who volunteered to serve as an army chaplain overseas during World War II. When the Allies finally won the victory, it looked if Pastor Gerke was going to be able to go home and be reunited with his wife and his family. But... Because he was a Lutheran, and because he spoke German, top brass redirected him. They requested that he remain in Europe a bit longer for a special assignment. Pastor Gerke was to travel to Nuremberg, Germany. And there he was to serve as the personal chaplain to the Nazi war criminals who were being put on trial by the International Tribunal for the unspeakable things that they had done, including the carefully orchestrated murder of millions of Jews. These were men who had certainly drawn a circle of their own around the group of people that they thought were worth valuing. And everyone outside of their circle was beyond their care Beyond their pity, the world knew them as monsters and spoke of them with the label of monsters. And they were. But Pastor Gerke, he had a calling. A, co a calling not only to the allied authorities, but also a calling from our God, whose mercy is so broad. By God's grace, Chaplain Gerke didn't draw his circle so narrowly that it excluded these men that he was going to minister to. He spoke to them frankly about their sins and about their need for a savior. He told them about Jesus Christ who had borne their sins, yes, all of their sins, even theirs upon himself on the cross. Now, there were some of those war criminals like Hermann Goering, who refused to believe that Jesus could help him, who refused to believe that Jesus was anything other than a man. And in the end, Goering committed suicide in his cell with a cyanide pill. He died without hope, without God, and without the divine mercy and forgiveness which God was so graciously extending to him through Pastor Gerke. But several other prominent Nazis came to acknowledge their overwhelming sin. They confessed their evil to Gerke and to God. And he pronounced holy absolution to them. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He communed them with the very body and blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and the wine in their cells. He continued to minister to them with God's word and God's promises right there in their prison cells. And a number of those men were eventually condemned to die. And Pastor Gerke walked beside five of them on their way to be hanged. Some of those men you will see, you will meet one day in the light and the joy of Christ's kingdom where forgiven sinners are in Christ's glory and love forever. Back in 2015, a journalist by the name of uh, Tim Townsend wrote a book uh, about Gerke's chaplaincy to these Nazis. It's called Mission at Nuremberg. And from the beginning to the end, 
It gives striking testimony to the wide mercy of God and to the beauty of that mercy being extended through the lives of his people. But not everyone appreciated the book. You see, the the circle drawing spirit of Jonah is still alive and still well in many hearts today, my dear friends. If you go on Amazon and read the review comments, um, many of them, most of them are quite positive, uh, but there are two very negative reviews that really stand out. The first one star review reads this, getting close to these monsters and giving them human qualities and emotions is very difficult to swallow. I understand the Christian philosophy of forgiveness, but that should be left to God. Let them go to their deaths fearing that they may burn in hell. They provided no comfort to those they burned. The other reviewer, who also gave the book one star, was offended for the same reason. He writes, it appears that the author tries to rationalize why Gierke became so close to the Nazis. He does this in a number of ways. First, by giving a short biography of each Nazi, quoting numerous times, Gerke strived to remember that before their alliance with Hitler, before the choices they made that led to mayhem and murder, that they had all been boys once and that they were all still God's children. The reader begins to wonder his purpose other than to downgrade what the Nazis had done. And the review closes with the blunt statement, just asking forgiveness is not enough to save these Nazi monsters' souls. But it is, my dear friends. It is because of Christ Jesus. My dear friends, God's love extends to all people to the Assyrians, to the Nazis, to monsters, to sinners, to you and to me. His mercy is so great, so wide, because of Jesus the Christ, God's only begotten Son, who came to be Savior of all. The whole world, every nation, every person. We hear it often. We can probably recite it from memory, many of us. But hear the words that Jesus speaks in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.19. In Romans 5.18, Paul says, As Adam's one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so Jesus... One act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. Christ died for all, St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Christ died for all. And elsewhere, Paul writes, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. It is remarkable that no one is excluded from God's mercy. It is remarkable that God's love for sinners in Christ Jesus is so broad, so wide, that it excludes no race or clan, no woman or man. But for me, what is most remarkable, what is so amazing, is that God's love and mercy includes even me. No one, no one is excluded from God's pity and love. After the sermon, we're going to sing our hymn of the day, which is written by Herman Stumpfel, Jr. And he writes this in the first stanza of the hymn. How wide the love of Christ, 
It knows no class or race, but hold our one humanity within its broad embrace. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as God's mercy and love extends to all, he calls us as his forgiven children to erase the lines that we've drawn in our hearts. No more circles. God calls us to love and to care, to be more like Chaplain Gerke and less like Jonah. For there is no difference, my dear friends. All people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God's mercy and his saving righteousness and forgiveness in Christ Jesus is for all people, for Jews and Gentiles, for slaves and free, for rich and poor, for black and white, for citizens and for immigrants, for male and female, and for those who are confused about their gender and disordered in their sexuality. God's love and mercy in Christ extends to all people. It extends to those in labor and to those in management. It extends to the Democrat and the Republican. It extends to the progressive and to the nationalists to your neighbor whose dog is constantly getting into your trash, and to that person whose social media posts just get under your skin like no one else in the entire world. God's mercy extends to all these people, and even to you. Chief of sinners though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me. Lent is a season of repentance, my dear friends. It's time to examine our own hearts before God, to confess our sins, and to cling to his enormous mercy for us in Christ Jesus. Lord God, open my eyes to see my own lack of love and mercy for others. Help me see how I have been like Jonah. Show me the lines that I have drawn in my heart to exclude others from my pity and my love, from my prayers, and from my helping hand. Lord God, have mercy on a narrow-hearted sinner like me. Grant me your grace that I may walk in love and mercy toward all with a wider heart of love and a wider mercy toward every other person, just as your mercy is for all, Heavenly Father, even for me. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our service will continue as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn uh, 535, with a full introduction.
I invite you to stand as you are able for the prayer of the church. Camera went crazy, sorry. It was like, oh, right here. <laughs> um, which is not a good, good vision. Right, but um, uh, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their deeds. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our hearts and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphan, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Finally, for these and for all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. We pray the collect of the day. Lord of all mercy and God of all grace, your love in Christ Jesus knows no limits and is for all people. As you have bestowed your love on us, soften our hearts and help us to show and share your love with everyone around us that we may fulfill your will and the law of Christ. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray the collect for the word. Blessed Lord, you have caused all the Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray in Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Receive the blessing, the Lord. The Lord bless us. Uh, or bless, bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. The Lord bless and preserve you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn in 421 with a brief introduction. <laughs>
Good morning once again. I'm glad you will join us on this, the sixth and last Wednesday of the season of Lent. Next week is Holy Week. We'll have our normal services on Sunday at um, uh, 10 15. And then on Thursday, we will have an 11 a.m. service that will be live streamed on Holy Thursday, Monday, Thursday, and uh, also a service at 7 p.m. Uh, we will not be stripping the altar in the morning service, but we will uh, conclude our service uh, Thursday night with the stripping of the altar. And then on Holy Friday or Good Friday, we'll gather once together again um, as we continue that service uh, that starts Thursday night uh, at 11 a.m. and also 7 p.m. in person, and we'll be live streaming as well. Um, I don't think there are any other announcements for us. I will greet you in the back. There is no departure music, so I apologize for that. But uh, um, we'd like to thank those that join us via our YouTube channel. We hope you can join us uh, in the near future. And we do long for the day that you'll be able to join us in person and worship with us as the body of Christ in this place. But until that day comes, continue to uh, join us as often as you are able.